Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is one of the crowning achievements of quantum mechanics. We're kind of getting to a lot of the most important stuff right here, a lot of the coolest results. The uncertainty principle is something you may have heard of, actually. It's that big of a thing. So 1927, this 26-year-old German named Werner Heisenberg comes up with this really, really interesting treatment. Let's see how this works. We recall, of course, that if we have electrons and they hit a double slit apparatus like this, here I'm gonna send in my electrons, then I'm going to get a fringe pattern over here. Let me try to draw it a little bit carefully. We've got some bright fringes and some dark fringes. And on this screen, let's say there's a phosphor over here that's glowing every time an electron hits it, we get a big peak of electrons right in the middle and no electrons right here and right here. And then another smaller peak right here and a smaller peak right here. And there's this wobbly wobbly that goes on here for a long time. But uh, <clears throat> the, the interesting thing is that even if the electrons come through one at a time, these electrons will interfere with each other. They're going through both at the same time and creating, well, creating a, uh, a who the heck knows where the electron's gonna go when it gets through here because it's as if they are bending as they reach this point right here. There's nothing exerting a force on them though. It's not like there's a magnet there that's turning the electrons or something. It's that by confining them to go through a slit, there's some uncertainty introduced into which direction they're going. So let's develop that a little bit further. Um, I'm gonna go to just a single slit. And on this single slit, let's, let's take another uh, sheet entirely. Here I have electrons coming in over here. And the width of the slit will be defined as W. Let's set this up and then send some electrons in. My electrons will be orange this time. Electrons are coming in this direction. And I don't care if you send them in one at a time but uh, many electrons will hit the wall, but the electrons that make it through do eventually appear on a screen that's going to be, mm, I don't know, let's put it right here so we can do a little bit of math also. Let's make the screen purple, and since the electrons are orange, we're gonna say that there is a bright fringe. Remember, with the, um, <clears throat> With the single slit diffraction, you should review that if that's not something that you remember easily. With the single slit diffraction, we have a very wide central fringe, and then we have other bright fringes, and we're not gonna talk about them, but they're a little bit narrower, and they taper off like this. I'm interested in primarily the wide central fringe. This is the sloppiest derivation of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that you will ever see. If you wanna see it in more detail, you'll have to look in a deeper physics class. But my introduction right here is just gonna tell you kind of a feel for the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. I'm frankly happy that we can even do this much. So there we go. And then I'm gonna give you an angle here, theta. And I guess what I'm saying is, when an electron goes through this slit, it will appear somewhere there is a bright fringe. So if it might appear here, there's a, a pretty good chance of it appearing right there, but there's also a very reasonable chance that it might appear here. I mean, here on the screen, here on the screen. This is maybe the most likely place for it to appear, <clears throat> but way fewer than 50% of the electrons appear right here. You got some appearing here, some appearing here. Some will even appear here. But remember, I'm gonna disregard those guys right now. I'm gonna say that there's some chance that the electron will fall right in here. It's most likely to fall somewhere in the middle because remember, they're all lined up exactly. They're all coming in exactly horizontally. So you would think if it were just classical physics that they would all appear at this point right here because they're all pointing exactly straight or maybe just a, a width of W. But this is way wider than W. Depending on the angle, there's a spreading because of diffraction. So electrons are interfering with themselves. I want to first define where that dark fringe is. Remember for single slit diffraction, it's as if there are two little double slits. I'm not going to go through that, but I'm going to tell you that a dark fringe appears here. My dark fringe is at d times sine of theta is a wavelength. And we're talking about the wavelength of the electron, so we're fully quantum here. This may be a huge headache for you, I don't know. But I'm okay saying that, that the dark fringe is at where d sine theta is the wavelength of the electron. And I'll present to you some vectors. Here's a vector, and this is the vector of, well, this is the overall momentum of an electron that just makes it to the edge right there. And then I can define these two components of that vector. Well, this guy here is going to be the, I'm gonna call it delta P in the, ooh, delta P in the Y direction. So I now I need to set up my axes. I've got X here 
and y here. And I'm going to call this the momentum in the x direction. We know it has momentum in the x direction, and nobody is saying that there's any weirdness in that. But I'm saying that as soon as the electron goes through this slit, you don't know which way it's pointing in y. You don't know what its momentum will do in y. It may get no momentum in y and then hit right here. It may get some momentum in y and hit up here, or some negative momentum in y and hit down here. This, the fact that there is a wide fringe means that there is uncertainty in which way the electron is going in the y direction. So I don't want you to think as of this as change in momentum in the y direction. That's how we used to write deltas. This is uncertainty and momentum in the y direction. Let me actually label that. Uncertainty in y momentum. Now let's think about uncertainty in position. There is some uncertainty in the y position at this moment right here. We don't exactly know where the electron is inside of this slit. We kind of think that it might be a lot of places because it's doing some quantum stuff, but the uncertainty, I'm gonna label that as the uncertainty in the y momentum, uncertainty in y position is delta y. And that's kind of like w. Do you notice that we really don't know whether it's gone here, 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 here. So there's some uncertainty in the y uh, position as it enters this single slit apparatus. So here's my plan. I can rearrange this just a little bit and find that the sine of theta, let's go orange for this next line, the sine of theta is approximately equal to lambda divided by the width of my slit. Okay, so that's all right, that's all right. So there's a little bit of uncertainty here. Dark fringe, dark fringe, and in between those two dark fringes, we've got the width of our central fringe. Now you remember, of course, that lambda is h over p sub x. This is de Broglie who says that, that if there's uncertainty, well, no, that's not what he says. He's saying that if there's momentum, and there is momentum in the x direction, then there is a wavelength. And that wavelength is defined by h, Planck's constant, divided by the momentum right there. So here's what I'm saying. This electron beam spreads out in a diffraction pattern, which means that the electron has momentum uncertainty. And I'm gonna say the momentum uncertainty, ooh, can we talk about this? Can we talk about how the width of this slit will affect the uncertainty over here? I think we should do that. Consider, if you will, a slit that is very, very narrow. Do you remember what the fringe pattern for a very narrow slit looks like? Oh yeah, it's really spread out. And what if I have a slit pattern that is very, very wide? Well, if it's a very wide slit pattern, then we don't have as much diffraction. Or maybe what I mean is these are closer together, so we're actually going to get a much narrower peak as a result. This is very counterintuitive, but go back and look at how diffraction works, and you'll find that a, well, the better, ooh, the better we know where this electron was, the worse we know which way it's going up and down. The, oh, look at this. The worse we know about where the electron is up and down, the more accurately we know how fast it's going up and down. This is very interesting. There's like a trade-off. Like you get to know one thing, but not the other. So let's go back here and do a little bit of math, a little bit more careful. I want to use the small angle approximation small angles, and I'm gonna say that that means that the screen is very, very far away. So we have a small angle for the width of that peak right there, and I'm gonna say that sine of theta is approximately theta, and I'm saying that theta is about lambda over the width of the slit. But what I'm about to do, watch this. I'm about to say that this is, well, it's kind of about also, it's going to be delta PY, remember this is delta PY right there, divided by P sub X. Did I make an X there? Sorry, delta PY divided by P sub X. Because the sine of theta is pretty much the tangent of theta. So I've got opposite divided by adjacent. And for small angles, the same angle of theta right here, sine of theta and tangent of theta and theta are all pretty much the same thing. I've done that in a few videos. I'm not gonna do that again for you today. We've got two definitions that we need. I'm gonna solve this equation for P sub X first. And P sub X is H over lambda. And I'm gonna take that 
that's a lambda, not an x. P sub x is h over lambda. I'm going to plug it in right here. Watch me put it right there. And the other equation that I need is an equation for the width being about delta y. Oh, no, I've already put that in there. No, no, let's do that. Let's say that this equation is going to go in here. And so my equation then, what was right here, will be rewritten as lambda divided by delta y, because that's my w, is approximately, uh, well, it's going to be delta py, and then I have to, well, I'm going to divide by px, so I'm going to write the inverse of this sucker here. It's going to be lambda over h. And if I rearrange these guys, canceling out my lambdas, that's fun, cancel, cancel, then I get, ooh, 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 I get delta py times delta y is about the same as Planck's constant. Whoa! So if you've seen some physics already and you're reviewing to see if I'm doing this stupidly, you'll say, that's not exactly what it is, Dr. Schuster, and I'll say, you're right. In fact, this uncertainty in the momentum in the y direction multiplied by the uncertainty of the position in the y direction has to be greater than or equal to 2 pi, h divided by 2 pi. So I've got delta py times delta y, and a more formal treatment will get you this result right here. That is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and a lot of people write h divided by 2 pi all the time, so a lot of people will write the Heisenberg uncertainty principle like this. They will say that the uncertainty in momentum in the y direction multiplied by the uncertainty, ah, that's not what they'll write. Dang it. The uncertainty in momentum in the y direction multiplied by the uncertainty in position in the y direction has to be equal to or greater than h divided by 2 pi, which is just h bar. That means divided by 2 pi. It's a cool symbol. You can write all sorts of things divided by 2 pi by just putting a little slash through them. Like they're canceled, but they're not. They're just divided by 2 pi. So this is really, really, really deeply awesome. Heisenberg's wife would lose his, her keys from time to time, and she would always say to him, Honey, I don't know where my keys are. And Heisenberg would respond, Sweetie, it is likely that you know far too much about their velocity. You see, momentum and velocity are just proportional to mass, related by mass. So if she knew, oh man, that's funny. Shut up, I'm not going to explain that to you. That's a good joke. Or the cops would pull over Heisenberg sometimes, and the cop comes up to him and he's like, uh, Professor Heisenberg, do you have any idea how fast you were going? And Heisenberg says, no, but I knew exactly where I was. Ah, so good. Now, that's all well and good, but here's another, here's another uncertainty equation that can be derived in a similar manner, different experiment probably. So I'm saying that the uncertainty in the energy of a system multiplied by the uncertainty in the time that you take to measure that energy is also always greater than or equal to h divided by 2 pi, or h bar. Oh my goodness. You're saying that if I don't spend very much time measuring a system, I can't tell what its energy is. If the time uncertainty is very big, ooh, I guess that's what I mean. If I measure a very, very accurate time, then the time uncertainty is very small then the energy uncertainty will be very, very big. In fact, at smaller and smaller time intervals, that means you're getting more and more accurate knowledge of the time, if you are measuring at a very, 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 very small interval, you have frankly no idea how much energy a system can have. And looked on short time scales, you get stuff called quantum foam. That's pretty cool. Quantum foam is stuff that pops into existence and out of existence very, very rapidly because this time uncertainty is incredibly small, so the energy uncertainty has to become incredibly big. This is a fundamental uncertainty. It talks about what can be known and what can't be known about the universe. There's no way to circumvent this. This example of electrons going through a single slit is simply a way to derive it, but it applies to everything all the time. If you know one thing too accurately, then you're fundamentally screwing up another thing. I like to think of it like this. You know that there might be, I don't know, a can of Campbell's soup right here, but it's extremely, extremely small. Like, let's say it's an electron or something. So there's an electron right here. And the electron, you want to know where it is, right? So you're looking at the electron. Now, what does it mean to look at the electron? It means that the electron must be reflecting some 
photons to your eyes. Every time you want to shine a light on that electron, you want to shine a light on this electron, you want to hit this electron with a photon, that's what Compton did. And you know what Compton found? He found that that electron would go some crazy direction as a result of its interaction with the photon. The only way to observe a system is to change it in the act of observation. And in fact, the more accurately you want to know the position of this electron, the higher energy photons that you must send to it, because the higher energy photons have a, let's see, energy is H times F. The higher energy photons have a higher frequency, which means that, uh, let's see, F big implies E big, which implies that the wavelength is small, which means that you'll be able to very accurately know where the electron was. But the more energy you send in to hit this electron, the more you're kicking it who the heck knows where. Not just you don't know how fast it's going, you frankly have no idea which way it's going. If you know where an electron is, then you suddenly have no way of knowing which way it's going. That's what Heisenberg is saying to you. It is not just a special case of observing electrons or uh, this double slit thing or single slit thing. It's real, it's deep, and it's fundamental. It's very, very interesting physics.